Our next speaker is a jazz critic and author, a frequent contributor to Jazz Times. It's my pleasure to introduce Aidan Levi. Um, thank you to uh, Dimitri Vasilakis and uh, can you all hear me all right? The Jazz Journalist Association and uh, the permanent mission of Greece to the United Nations. Um, after all, it's Socrates who is one of the greatest improvisers in the history of the world. I think we can all agree on that. Um, Plato wrote about the importance of rhythm. Um, but it, it's a hard truth that you can have democracy without equality. And in this era of government challenges to arts funding and education, it seems increasingly evident that you can have democracy without jazz. But you can't have jazz without democracy. This is one of the key tenets of my forthcoming biography of Sonny Rollins, who has lived with this reality for 87 years now. 60 years ago, in 1958, the iconoclastic saxophone colossus recorded the Freedom Suite, a soundtrack to a revolution that could not be silenced, and a quintessential jazz protest album. Composed for a pianoless trio with Oscar Pettiford and Max Roach, who would release We Insist, Max Roach's Freedom Now Suite with Abby Lincoln three years later, the Freedom Suite's eponymous 19-minute composition typified democracy in action. Rollins composed the piece inspired in part by the housing discrimination he faced, even as a jazz icon, and the myriad injustices he saw around him daily, which he attested to in his eloquent liner notes. He wrote, quote, America is deeply rooted in Negro culture, its colloquialisms, its humor, its music. How ironic that the Negro, who more than any other people can claim America's culture as his own, is being persecuted and repressed. That the Negro, who has exemplified the humanities in his very existence, is being rewarded with inhumanity, end quote. After the album's release, Rollins faced backlash from some fans, and the Riverside label pulled it from circulation, replacing the Freedom Suite with Shadow Waltz, the same album with a different cover, renamed for a track on the original's B-side. But Rollins would not remain in the shadows. The new cover bore a striking resemblance to a famous portrait of Frederick Douglass. His commitment to global democracy began before he could play the saxophone. When Rollins was a young boy growing up in Harlem, he joined his grandmother, a supporter of Marcus Garvey, in protests advocating for the Scottsboro Boys and against the Italian invasion of Ethiopia and the de facto house arrest of Paul Robeson. Robeson was his hero, a champion of civil rights before it became a defined movement. In his high school yearbook, everyone had to write what they wanted to be when they grew up. Ball player, lawyer, civil engineer. Rollins wrote, quote, a second Paul Robeson. It is this spirit of radical egalitarianism that he brought to his music but he has always known that jazz signifies an ideal that democracy could only hope to achieve. It has never stopped him from trying in the face of adversity, though. When I first began researching my biography of Rollins, he told me that societies often don't change, but individuals can. As an incandescent soloist on the front lines of democracy and one of jazz's greatest ambassadors, Rollins has navigated these changes as a spiritual individual living with the dissonance of an imperfect world. That meant representing the bridge between jazz and democracy, sometimes quite literally. Quote, jazz has always been a music of integration, Rollins once said, adding that, quote, jazz was not just a music, it was a social force in this country, and it was talking about freedom and people enjoying things for what they are, and not having to worry about whether they were supposed to be white or black. A lot of times, jazz means no barriers, a sentiment that is just as relevant today as it ever was. Thank you. <laughs> 